Welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. The college consists of the following format. Is there a tip in there? The first part will be the speaker will speak. The second part will be a question and answer period. And the third part will be our infamous rebuttal period where you'll be able to take and uh, rebut the speaker on or off subject. I, uh, <coughs> Go ahead and sit down. Come on up, Heather. I would like again to give this lady a hand for the service she's rendered to us. And uh, just uh, to give a credit to support her a little bit. Okay? And uh, thanks, no problem, Heather. Keep up the good work. We hope we treat you well. All right. I heard we had a speaker tonight. Do you have any more? His uh, name is Daniel Staub Weinberg, and he's going to be doing, will present art from newspaper cartoonists like Art Young, Bill Maldine, Avi Katz, Nazis, Democrats, Republicans, Socialists, and others. He's got a good presentation coming, and uh, let's get this started. Dan, if you're ready, let's give Dan a nice big hand. I want to thank Tim and Charlie for helping out on my talk. Excuse me. Um, okay. So I actually want to say a few things about anarchy first before we start. And this is from Aunt, uh, Emma Goldman's speech at when she got charged and sentenced to about a couple of years in prison when she was 25 years old. She said, I can fully understand people who hate the anarchists for it is their endeavor to abolish private property, state and church. In one word, they aim to free men from tyrants and government. Yeah. And she also said, we, that we anarchists seek the establishment of anarchy, or in other words, of freedom from government of any kind, a community of interests based upon common production of equal and necessary character. We need, we seek a perfect liberty for each individual to enjoy the grand and glorious products of nature. She was really something. Okay, so art and politics. And before I start, there's a Chicago Sun Times. How many people subscribe to a newspaper, a daily newspaper? Daily. Nobody? One person. Okay, well, there are no, there are zero cartoons in there, as you can see. They all disappeared in the 80s, probably. 70s. Anyway, so let's move on. So this is Avi Katz, he's a Israeli, American Israeli. And so he made a he made fun of uh, Netanyahu in the middle of uh, some Likud, some of his party, and so he made a cartoon about it. But he made them as pigs, which uh, the the uh, Jerusalem Post, or maybe it was Hot Arts newspaper. What? Anyway, so uh, he got fired for making this uh, picture in front of the president, prime minister, and his uh, party. So uh, people, cartoonists get fired for for making fun of people. Cartoonists are like clowns in a certain way. And he's a pretty good artist, not the greatest. So this is uh, Saul Steinberg from 1993, The New Yorker. And it says, beware of the artist. He's just being funny. He was a little depressed, I think. But, um, I need a spoon for the ice cream. Whoops. How did I get it back to him? Whoa! Fuck. To just touch the screen. Okay. 
All right, I got it. Thank you. You're welcome, dear. So this is a 2000 Saul Steinberg um, cartoon from the New Yorker. It's um, it's making fun of Israel, basically. It's New York City with uh, Golan Heights, Gaza, and the West Bank. And uh, West Bank is next to Central Park. And so it's very creative, a little crazy. That's all. Um, Steinberg worked for the New Yorker for about 50 years, and he made quite a lot of different cartoons. Uh, they were all political, all social and political. This is Jacob Burke from 1944. He was working for the Chicago Sun Times, actually. I know his son. You know his son? Can you speak up a little bit? Yeah. Uh, this is a strike. And um, in 1944, and um, so he he drew a lot of pictures of um, strikes. And he was a communist in 1926. Then he went to Russia, and he uh, spoke with Stalin in the, about the, in the 30s. And Stalin was telling him what to draw, and he didn't like that. So he came back and quit being a communist, and he ended up working for the Chicago Sun-Times for about 40 years, from 1930 to the 70s. Actually, when he died in 82, he was still working for the Chicago Sun-Times. This is another picture, J.P. Morgan, 1940. Uh, it says Congress, and so he's buying Congress. Uh, J.P. Morgan is the big, large man uh, cutting out Congress because money buys everything, as we all know. This is uh, Bill Malden of the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, 1960. And he's, there are two southern gentlemen, and he's pointing at, at somebody, and he says, uh, let that one, let that one go because uh, you don't want to be equal. It's kind of uh, liberal. Let that one go because uh, you don't want to be equal. So it's sort of making fun of white suppressed, white superiority, white um, racism, violence. Um, there was the, uh, what do you call them? When they hang people, lynchings in the South up in 1960, they were still going on. They still go on today. Tim, can we move that projector back to the other table? <coughs> the pictures are off the screen. If not, leave it. What, uh, Ch Charlie? The screen? You mean? No, just move the projector to Tim. Uh, that's all right. No. Oh. You have to move the whole table. That's quite a job. You what can if move you it move back. the screen back? No, we can't. can't. I'll right. give me a minute. If you can move the table back. Charlie, you could have fixed it. I thought you were going to fix it, but make them into full screens. It's pretty good. We could have done that. Then. Should have done it. Could have, should have, would have. He'd have told me I could have. Yeah. Okay. All right. So this is um, fascism, 1935. Yeah. Burke, 1935, fascism. So in the left hand, it's, it says communist worker. That says socialist worker. So, in fighting fascism. 
Do you want to? Uh, do you want to? It says on the left side. But go ahead. Read it. Bring the computer up to you. This says, Bill Ma Malden, uh, St. Louis Post Dispatch, 1962. It says, uh, investigate them? No. Investigate heck. them, heck, what's the man's posse? That's man, that's my posse, that's my posse. So investigate them, invest no, he's telling the congressman to not investigate the Ku Klux Klan because they're my posse. So he was he was kind of radical, a little radical, even though he so he had a job, and maybe that's why the Sun Times doesn't hire anybody full time anymore. They just might hire them for big events. This is uh, Mike Luganak in 2018. Uh, you can't silence the the right race, side of history. The right side of history. And the, 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 the mask on the mouth of uh, Statue of Liberty is an is a Israeli flag, actually. So it's, I think it's a little racist, but um, he's kind of a radical, Mike Fluganak. He mostly writes about uh, marijuana laws. He's very big on smoking marijuana and being against marijuana laws. Uh, being for free marijuana, not just medical, but he also talks about Palestine and Israel. Uh, so the Statue of Liberty is holding BDS, Boycott, Divest, Sanction, which is a radical idea started by Palestinians in 2005, and uh, now some Jewish groups are supporting it. Ireland just supported uh, BDS in their in their Congress. They said it was okay. They had a vote and they passed it, uh, supporting BDS. This is um, Lenin, 1920 Russia, oh, yeah. visiting peasants. He's he's a very bourgeois person. He was a leader of the revolution, and he's going to a small little town and speaking with the poor people. So he's a man of the people. And villages. And villages. And uh, peasants, what are they called? In Russia? Peasants. Peasants? Christian. No. No. Serfs. Serfs. Kulak. Serfs. Ah, Kulak and... Uh, Serf. Um, <laughs> anyways, so it's very much propaganda given by the Communist Party is Lenin is, is this ideal uh, coming to the poor people and being a man of the people. Something like uh, Trump is a man of the people when he comes to Michigan and Indiana. He's just one of the guys. He's for everybody being better Americans, proud Americans. Make America great again. Actually, that's what Make America Great Again is what uh, Reagan and Bush used in 1980. It said, let's make America great again. And uh, so it's not an original thought, obviously. Is he starting sitting down on that picture or he's very short? He's sitting. He's sitting. He's sitting. Yeah, he's sitting. He's listening to the old man talking. Talk Why about how tough life is. And Why do you say he was a bourgeoisie? Because he was. Who, Lenin? Yeah. He was a worker? I don't think he was a worker. No, but he was a communist Actually, intellectual. He's from very wealthy family. Yes, I'm he's not a bourgeoisie. He's not a bourgeoisie. He's like that black sheep that went to art school. Family. But he gave all that. Like his father how about just another power hungry dictator? Yeah, but he just, I don't know. If somebody. He, he probably eats in better restaurants than dad. The communism was a bourgeoisie. No. Did, did, you, did you study for this? No, I didn't. You know, I didn't study at all. You're making this up as you go. Yes, I did. 
tell indigenous. You're still dead wrong, Charlie, about communism. I do like Conrad Levin. It's not a. Not a hey, one fool at a time, guys. I one fool at a time. One fool at a time. Uh, You're still dead wrong, Charlie. I think the leaders of the Communist Party probably ate pretty good at it. Like a dapper or something. That's the times of bourgeoisie. Yeah, actually, just the opposite. He was more proletarian, let's put it that way. Oh, okay. All right. I got to learn some history. All right. So this is an indigenous uh, council of the government. This is That's what it means in front. No, this is a, a Mexican from Mexico. This is a poster from the Indigenous Council of Government. Consejo Indígena a de Gobierno. And uh, her name is Maria de Jesus. And Patricio Martinez is her name. And it was from, uh, she was from Tucpan, Jalisco State. And so she's, I, her ideal is a very simple person. She's an indigenous Indian. She's not, uh, from, she's not from Spain, part of the leadership of Spain, of Mexico. Most of the leaders of Mexico and the government are from Spain, they're sort of whitish people. The brown people are indigenous and they're pretty weak politically. So uh, they have their own councils in uh, probably southern Mexico, close to Guatemala. What year was that? This is 2017. It's fairly recent. This is another Malden. Uh, he's, he's saying, why are you looking so sad? I got, I got out of it OK. Say that in the mic. Why are you looking so sad? Why you, I got out of it okay. So the the bomb, what is that? A, some kind of jeep or something? And uh, so he's, he's he's he commiserates with the common soldier. He doesn't go. Uh, he doesn't uh, honor the officers a lot. And actually, he uh, Malden was a soldier in 1942 and um, he had a meeting with um, Patton, General Patton and Patton and him talked about how Walden didn't respect, give enough respect to the officers and Walden didn't change his views and Patton didn't change his views so their meeting went not so good so later Patton said said that if Malden, if he met Malden again, he would arrest Malden because he didn't like what he said about, about officers. Because Malden just focused on the common soldier, infantry. Uh, this is Anita Alvarez, uh, and she was, uh, she ran in 2008 for um, state's attorney of Cook County. Maybe you remember. Uh, I think it was, she was running against, well, I'll show you. She was running against Tim At Tom Allen, Howard Brookins, Larry Sufferden, and Robert, and some other people. So Howard Brookins was the Afri African American uh, alderman. Tom Allen was a party hack. And Larry Sufferden is, is on the Cook County Board. And so it was a very close race, as you can see. Anita Alvarez won by like 1% over Tom Allen and by like 3% over Larry Sufferden. So it was a close race. And one piece of mail, I know the person who made this piece of mail that went out to citizens in, the, in Cook County, probably in the... Mexican neighborhoods or some other neighborhoods. So it showed, uh, which is true, this is all true stuff. So that's what happens in campaigns. The people, it's a campaign, and so the artists write about sensitive subjects and try to get people excited to vote a certain way. I know some people here are very sophisticated, 
and some piece of mail that comes in your mailbox probably won't affect your vote at all. And that's good, that's okay. But some people are um, changed by pieces of mail. Some people are piece changed by advertisements on the on TV. That's why Obama raised a billion dollars for his campaign. But anyway, so this piece of mail. He had good TV. Huh? He raised a billion dollars only because he had good TV. That's one thing it was for. Well, I'm sure that the Republicans raised 800 million, so it's close. Anyway, so um, so he, it says, the headline says, 120 years for an attacker of girl X. So it tries to get people excited about an African-American being attacked of a girl. And this is to get people angry, I guess. I'm not sure exactly why the person made this piece of mail, but it was a campaign. And campaign is like war. In a, in a war, you have campaigns. Campaigns in Europe, campaigns in Africa, campaigns in Russia. So this is a campaign. It's a war campaign when you have a political uh, fight. This is another, uh, I remember seeing this in the Sun Times in 1963 when John Kennedy was killed, assassinated. So it shows Lincoln crying. It's a very famous, I think it's famous, uh, How old are you? cartoon. What? How old are you? About nine years old, ten years old. Do you remember it? Huh? Do you remember it? Do you remember it? Yeah, I remember. I remember. Yeah, I remember vaguely seeing it in the newspaper. My parents got a lot of newspapers daily at that time. Anyway, so uh, Lincoln is crying because Kennedy got shot, and so this is this might be emotional. It might be funny. It might be uh, controversial. But uh, it was put in the newspaper, so people saw it, 100,000, thousands of people saw it, and maybe they cried, maybe they laughed, maybe they were, weren't for Kennedy, maybe they weren't for Lincoln, maybe they liked slavery, I don't know. But, um, but Malden did it, and he had a job, he went five days a week to the Sun-Times to draw this stuff until, um, until he died. He just died about 10 years ago. 15 years ago, and um, I think it's pretty good, actually. 2003. Three? Yeah, so that's 15, 16 years. Okay, so this is uh, another Palestine picture, cartoon. Um, it's current, 2018. Um, Latouf is the artist's name. It says, resistance against colonialism is not a crime. It's a duty. And it says, uh, Union, UN General Assembly Resolution 3743, which is basically saying that um, Palestinians, Palestinians are oppressed by the Israelis and it should stop. So um, this is the, uh, this is the border, border between maybe Gaza and the uh, Israel, and so it's saying violence is, violence is, resistance against colonialism is not a crime. Self-defense is not a crime. And I think that's true. There's another uh, Walden, 1963, from the Chicago Sun-Times, and it says, Water? What do you mean, not so fast? So it shows that an African American reaching for equality. Equality is that equality is that flower at the top. It's sort of a liberal thing, you know. Don't move too moving too fast. The 1963 Civil Rights Act was being passed. Um, voting rights were being passed. Poll taxes, poll taxes in the South were being thrown away with, and uh, people were. People were thinking about things. Um, yeah. This is a New Yorker, Art Spiegelman, who, uh, 1999, New Yorker, New York City. It shows a policeman. 
doesn't say anything on the shield, I don't think, on his badge, shoulder pad. I see the policeman isn't here today. But anyway, so uh, the policeman is taking aim at different people in the, like at a uh, circus shooting gallery. So it's kind of funny, kind of serious. It was a cover of the New Yorker in, in uh, March 5th, 1999. And um, Spiegelman is married to the art editor of the New Yorker. So that probably helps him getting jobs, getting his art on the front of the New Yorker. And I'm sure this could be uh, any, any city in America. This is um, Art Spiegelman's mouse book about Jews in the Holocaust, Jewish Holocaust. And I, I used to be angry about this, like, why are Jews like mice? No, I'm not a mouse. I look like a mouse. Anyway, so, um, uh, so he made the Jews were mice and the Nazis were cats. And uh, so you have to agree with that analogy. And it became a bestseller and he won the prizes for this book. And uh, I'm sure he made some money from this book. But it was his story, his story about his father was in Auschwitz, his mother was in Auschwitz. His mother committed suicide in 1960-something. Um, so he didn't very, have a very happy childhood, maybe. But he got a lot of good stories from his father. So he made up this mouse. And um, he got his father to talk about Auschwitz. And, um, and the book came of it. It was pretty popular. And it's in a lot of public libraries. And there you go. <coughs> So this is Saul Steinberg, who was born in, uh, in 1914. He died in 1999. And uh, he was a very good artist. He went to yeah. art school, I think, in Italy. He was born in Romania. He came to America in the 40s, 30s. He was in the Army, actually. And he went to Europe. And he was drawing stuff in the Army. And so he drew this in 1942. And it's Hitler's program for 1942. And it shows, it's hilarious. 1939, 40, 41, 42. And then every year there's more and more blood. So he was talking about killing that people did. I'm sure he could have had Stalin there, could have had America there. Everybody kills. It's a, it's a sport. It's a thing people do in war. War is hell. Somebody said. This is another Steinberg with Hitler on top. And it says balance of nations. And so Hitler is shown on top, but he had a lot of help. He, he they used IBM computers in the in the killing camps to keep track of how many people were killed. To keep track of names. That's how they have so many names in Yad Vashem, because computers help IBM computers help keep track. So that was <clears throat> that was America helping Germany. So Hitler is on top of a lot of people. France. Hitler is on top of France and, Ger and uh, America and Russia and Spain. Whatever. All the he had a lot of help. That's the way life is. America gets a lot of help and. Nicaragua, Venezuela. So that's the way how, that's the way life is. That's the way politics is. So this is another Malden. His sympathy for the regular soldier soldier, Willie and Joe. They're commiserating. Yesterday you saved my life. I'm sorry for your back. Here's my last pair of dry socks. Yesterday you saved my life. I swear I'd pay you back. Here's my last pair of dry socks. So just difficult times, people help each other. And there's nothing about uh, officers commanding people and go fight. It's just two guys uh, commiserating on the battlefield and how war is. End of slideshow. So. So that's my whole thing, I guess.
Yeah. That's what? That's kind of short. That's it then? I have some more, actually, in another show. You want to do that? Um, I, th I think so. Where's the other show? You got it with you? I got it. I got keys. Yeah, yeah. 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 Let me get it set up. Weinberg. Yeah. Where's that email I sent you? Where did you sell those? I got it. I had to put them in together. You know. It's still in the email. We can just show it from here. Yeah. That's what? I sent him an email with about a dozen more. We don't have connectivity right now. That's why. Yeah, actually, we do. What? Yeah, it is connected. Sure. It's easy. You need a password, yeah. Can I have one of those little boxes? Yeah. How many? You just How many? Do you have it on your drive? Okay, then let's go do it on your drive. Yeah. Now, which one is it? Uh, did you put some ice in the water? Charlie, what are you doing? He wants to plug in. I don't need to plug it in. I just. I put it in with theirs because it's all on one table. Oh, so that's why. Thank you. You're welcome because you're together, right? Yeah, that's why. Ever since this problem we had, I have to put the proper tables in the proper, you know what I mean? I got to do things differently, so. Virginia. <laughs> well, the top part is Siberia, the bottom is like uh, Bosnia. It's the hammer and sickle, which is a Sami name, um, which is the sign of communism. Right. It's like the factory worker and farm worker. Like I said, West Virginia. <laughs> anyway, so this is a, uh, an actual art show in Germany from 1937 to 1938, supposedly Supposedly two million people went and saw it. And it was 
Jewish art, basically. This is a War Resisters League, Charlie. Um, this is an American group, I think, or maybe it's worldwide, and they are against war. And Charlie, Charles Paydock is a member of this. I'm secretary of the Chicago Chef. Wow. It's the oldest anti-war organization in the United States. And it's basically, it came about as a secular organization opposed to war, as opposed to some of the more religious-based groups, uh, which are all right, they all work together. But uh, this is for, if you wish, secular humanists who have a political position opposed to war. And their basic thing is nonviolent civil disobedience. Would they be against a defensive war? Like, say somebody attacks you or them, would they be against people defending themselves? Would they? I, that's a question I have. Yeah, they, they believe that you can resist eternally. Okay. Now, if you want it, that's a separate debate. Every single war could be defined as the defensive war. So they all are defensive wars. Every incursion of the Roman Empire from one of the little city state was due out for defensive reasons. Yeah. Okay. And they became a worldwide empire. Okay. So it's debate. defensive. Oh, we have to go to war. Okay. Next one. Yes. Yeah, sure. Well. Right. Well, who started the civil war in America? Was the, the South. South. South yeah. So if firing on Fort Sumter. Okay, so oh, if the oh, North oh, said, oh, yeah. so if the North just said, okay, let's let them secede. Let's talk. Yeah, let them secede. It's been going on since the time of Jackson. Okay. Anyway, so this is uh, Liberty or Death from uh, Cuba, 1959, and it's got a picture of. Fidel Castro. It's 60th anniversary today, I think. Viva la Reagan Revolucion. Viva la Revolucion. No, Viva la Revolucion de Reagan. De Reagan. <laughs> yeah, okay. All right, so this is Katz. All right, so this is Kim Fox. Vote for justice, for fairness. Vote for Kim Fox. And she won, actually. She beat. Well, she beat Alvarez in the primary, so um, that was two years ago, I think, right, 2016, and uh, she won. She is the current Cook County State's Attorney. This is more Alvarez stuff. This is uh, Iran, a grand gathering. Join us to be the voice of millions in Iran, our pledge. Free freedom, free for free Iran, free Iran, July 9th, 2016, 2016, Paris. Oh, Paris. Yeah. So these are expatriates that are in Paris, both talking about it and voting in Iran. It's kind of funny. These are anarchists, no gods, no masters, and the red A in the circle is anarchy. You know, you don't you don't see many anarchists on the six o'clock news anymore. Not like you used to. In the good old days. This is our Sandinista, Sandino. Los uh, Sandinistas. Los Sandinistas. Yeah. Frente Sandinista de Liberación. Por Liberación de la Nicaragua. El camino luminoso. Right, they're in the Peru. Peru? Peru. Peru. Right. right. So it shows a very independent peasant with a gun. I guess Sandino was a person from Nicaragua. This is um, Che Guevara. Revolución hasta la victoria siempre. The final battle will win. Until until all victory. 
until the final victory. <coughs> the final victory will be ours. Yeah. Right. They were right in Cuba. Cuba. They resisted America for 60 years. To their own detriment. They survived. They didn't, they didn't capitulate. This is a silly thing of Ronald McDonald on the cross in 2019, and this was from Haifa in Israel, the Haifa Art Museum, and it was taken down eventually. Some Christians didn't like it in the town of Haifa. It's pretty sacrilegious, it's pretty terrible. I think it's life-size, actually. This is Alvarez. And then Ram Emanuel. Yeah. Uh, I stand with Ram. So that was 15. So he's very I stand. He's not, he's not running for anything. He's, it's like his, his job is to be mayor. That's it. Fine. But I am mayor. Leave it or love it. So it's kind of humorous. It's kind of silly. And it has the four stars of that's a Chicago flag. And it has, This is a, this is a, one of Daly's first first uh, posters. Mayor Richie Richard M. Daly, Richard J. Daly. Get things done for Chicago. And uh, he won, of course, 1955. He died in '77, I think. So 22 years he was mayor. Uh, Great man. This is Carol Mosley Braun, who lost against Philandic in the primary, probably, in 1977. I don't know what it was. If anybody knows, let me know. Yeah? Oh, D. Lana. How do you say this? Yeah. It's better to listen. Yeah. So, I let them accumulate the evidence like against you in a secret police car. Yeah. So it's a very propaganda-ish. <coughs> don't, don't talk. Just listen. In Russian. This says Vasha Lampa the Lamp. Oh, yeah, it's like Tovarish in Janir. Mr. Actually, this is symbolized because the Russia was really, really cool. I don't know why this picture made, but it was wall. It was like this progress for Russia to have some light, some kind of light. It was like, whoa, you know, like this is college. <laughs> So, so probably. Like show is like wow. Thank you, old man. Do you have lights? What is it? No, mean? not really. Russia was very poor, actually. So when they industrialized, they made a lot of lamps. Right. And then they had a lot of light, and it was a big deal because Russia was very dark. And so an engineering was sort of a very standard um, occupation, sort of like maybe liberal arts here in America. Or sort of, you know, take English, everybody takes English. In Russia, you took engineering. This is Eugene Debs for president. Working men, vote your ticket. Debs and Emil Seidel for vice president. Debs ran from prison. I'm not, I'm not sure if that was this year, 1912. might have been 1920. And um, he lost, of course. But they, he won like 5.999% of the vote. They always, people in Wikipedia, I think it says 5%. And I would round it to 6%, but 6 is so much greater than 5, you know. So they have to minimalize the great socialist Eugene Debs. So, it's common knowledge that he maybe won 5 percent and uh, he was from Indiana, actually. Terre Haute. Terre Haute, right. There's a good documentary on him. 
This is uh, Gary McCarthy, current uh, candidate for mayor, and he uses the same four stars of the Chicago flag, something like Ron used, he's a cop, policeman. Gary Chico, he uses the same four stars, which is kind of funny. I mean, all these, these the candidates want to use the four stars of the flag to show how patriotic they are, I guess. It is red, white, and blue. Very patriotic. Chewy Garcia for mayor. Oh, yeah. For Chewy.com, 2015, his mustache. I saw a funny poster in Lincoln Square. It had Chewy Baca. It said, vote for Chewy. Why is it Rob Woody again? Huh? Why is it Rob? Why do you? Why would we do? Ron? Yeah. Uh, you probably thought he would lose. He was sure he would lose, so he quit running. What? Well, they push ahead. He wanted to be the first Jewish president, but I don't think he'll make it. Who's that? Ron. Emmanuel. Oh, yeah. Good riddance. He's a good mayor. Great mayor except for Laquan McDonald. So this is called the Unlawful Assembly by Art Young, 1909. Um, anarchists were getting arrested for unlawful assemblies in 1909. And so this is the, the uh, Robert Barons and rich, rich people getting together and they're having an unlawful assembly. So actually, Art Young was uh, charged with the Espionage Act in 19, of 1917, he was brought to court. He never got he never got put in prison for that, but he was put through court for drawing a picture, which is kind of interesting in America to be. You're supposed to have free speech, free speech, but not so much. Depends on who you are. This is a. Uh, this is an arrow. I know I have a lot. Maybe it's kind of too much, but um. no, keep going. All right. So this is Arab silence is on the gas tank, on the gas pump in Arabic. It says Arab silence, and it's in from Palestine. So Arab silence is gassing up the Israeli army tank. And, and I mean, it could be America gassing up the Israeli tank. It could be. Venezuela, it could be Saudi Arabia, it could be anybody. I mean, air of silence. America gives a lot of money to Israel. So it could be America gassing up the Israeli army. And in the background, there's Gaza burning. You know, Gaza got swamped in the three wars. I mean, it's something like the American Indians just being decimated, killed, wiped out, their land taken. And maybe maybe it's um, the way of the world and poor, rich, strong people push away poor, poor, weaker people. That's the way of the world, but sometimes people fight back. This is called El Insulto, Insulto. Es, es el lenguaje de los necios, language of fools. Maybe it refers to our president. Very disrespectfully, I say. But uh, or any president member of the College of Complexes. What he says about that we cannot read it. Sing the language. insult, language of fools. No, no, that's in English. El insulto. It says it in Spanish. Espanol. On the top. On the top. The insult, language of fools. In the top. Move it down. Move yeah, it down. Yeah, that's exactly what it says. It's in English. It's in English. Yeah, don't, uh, don't touch the projector. It's right. Right. All right. Language of fools. Mexi the insult, language of fools. Oh, he said this uh, projector. Yeah, don't touch the projector. So it's from Mexico in 2018. Uh, what does that mean? You know? What? You know the context? Not really. I'm just speculating that it's about 
Mr. Trump. But it could be about the Mexican president also. It could be about uh, any politician. I, I don't know if you could figure out what's written in the tie. I can't really read it. That's a signature. I'm not sure what it is. This is uh, Victor Berger, Victor L. Berger, running for U.S. Senator from the Socialist Party in Milwaukee. He lost. But um, there was a socialist president in, I mean, a socialist, oops, socialist, all uh, mayor of Milwaukee till 1960. Uh, Zeitlin, I think his name was. And there have been, there were two or three socialist mayors of Milwaukee before that, in the 19, earlier 1900s. So it wasn't that uh, uncommon. <coughs> I know today it would be very radical to have a socialist mayor. Uh, times have changed. But in the past, it was not so odd, talking about history. And he says, free, free press, free speech, for a speedy, general, lasting peace, tax the profiteers. So tax the Halliburtons and uh, Wall Street and all those people. Don't tax the poor, middle class. This is Navalny running for president of Russia. Oh, yeah, it's opponent right now. Opponent of Putin. And uh, it says, and the letters are N A V A. L, uh, uh, is the last letter. No. E. Ah, uh, yeah. L, E. Schmerky's knock. Schmerky's knock. Schmerky's knock. It's a soft sign. <laughs> anyway, so his name is Navalny. <laughs> and that's Navalny holding the so, sign. And the 2018 is a kind of unique way to say 2018 with like a, ex I guess that's an exclamation point. So he's a very one. strong opponent right now. Too. Well, he got like maybe 1% of the vote in 2018. Are, oh, and he, and Putin he put him in prison. He's a CIA actually. He was in jail when, he got, when the election yeah, came. But he's, he was, would right? get out for mm -hmm. uh, press conferences and interviews on the radio. So. Mm -hmm. He, he was not poor, not you a poor person. You can see him on YouTube. You know, yeah. yeah, you can see him on YouTube. So many but he speaks only Russian. So if you don't know Russian, you need a translator. Khorosho. Right, this is Mr. Obama, Hope. So it's a great, it's a great picture. He's looking up. up. When you look up, you're thinking about the future. And so he's thinking about the future. And... Um, he raised a lot of money, 500 million, whatever it was. It's a lot of money, I think. And um, so he gave this impression of hope and change. And uh, that's all I'll say about it. Motivational <laughs> speaker for president. Right. And the current president talks about hope and change, too, just in different words. Change in his pocket. Change, not change in his pocket, no. Anyway, so hope, H-O-P-E, and that word is not dope, hope. Anyway, so um, he looks very intelligent, very professional, and um, he won that election. So but against... Uh, he sold us off to the Israel... Who's he? John McCain. No, the first one. John McCain. John McCain in 2008? John McCain. Paler. All right, John McCain. Sarah Palin. John McCain. Yeah. All right, so this is boycott the best sanction in Palestine 2018. Um, the character next to BDS, to the right of BDS, is a Palestinian um, cartoonist rendering of some character. And so on the left side you see they're holding a key that'll fit into the city of somewhere. And occupation and apartheid right refugees right of return. This is uh, Netanyahu's sign on a bus actually. It says Hazak bit and Chazak bit kol kola. So strength through security and strength through economics. 
And then the bottom it says ha 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 lakud ha lakud the lakud party. So hazak hazak is Jews say that at the end of a group of at the end of a portion of the Torah when they read the Torah in the synagogue they say hazak hazak strength to strength and so maybe he's trying to refer to the Torah in that uh, campaign sign. What do you think of He won the election. And this is the last one I have, I think. Um, this is from the Logan Square protest every Saturday from 2 to 4. And we can stop the war. It's an anarchist um, sign with a fist. And it says, protest war and military militarism every week, Northside Peace Gathering every Saturday, 2 to 4 p.m. Three-cornered island of peace, Milwaukee, Logan, and Kedzie Avenue. And then uh, Hugo Chavez. This is a movie about him. The revolution will not be televised. I want to see that. 2002. And, um, <clears throat> um, it's a movie, won some awards, and Revolution Will Not Be Televised was a, actually a poem by Gil Scott Heron from the late 60s, and um, so Chavez grabbed that, or the, the maker of the movie grabbed that idea, and that's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Stay up there, Dan, for questions. Your first one, how come you stuck to leftist and communist literature and didn't put in anything like uh, like uh, good good capitalist stuff, too? You need I, a little balance in that stuff. Right. I had, I had like, let, let, um, let, let's make America great again. I had that. Um, okay. By Reagan and Bush. I had, um, some other ones also. I just didn't put them in there. You had some also some good Beavis and Butthead caricatures <laughs> of Trump and Pence. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll show them later on. Okay. <laughs> I have a question, I guess. Um, now you do art also, right? Is, yeah, um, a little bit. How is, you know, um, what, what's your theory of art? What kind of art do you do, and how have you learned, you know, from all this? Okay. I think I've, I've learned a lot from cartoonists like Burke and Steinberg and Spiegelman because they they take something very serious, like uh, I didn't show the the towers, the uh, World Trade Center is black. And it was a cover of a, the New Yorker, and they're shrouded in black. I mean, so they're very serious subjects, and they make it very simple. They condense, you know, 9/11 into two pictures, and I think I'm, I'm attracted to that. Um, when I was a kid, I used to ask my father, you know, are there any pictures in that book? And he'd say, no, no pictures. But so I wanted to see pictures. I always liked pictures. And if pictures tell are worth a thousand words. I think that's true. So, um, so that's what I do. That's what I believe. Okay. Who would you consider to be the greatest political cartoonist in the last hundred years? That's a good question. Well, I think Burke is very good. Um, Jacob Burke and uh, Steinberg. He's a little crazy. Uh, Spiegelman, uh -huh. pretty good. Uh, Robert, Robert, um, or Crum, Crum is pretty good. Uh -huh. Ivan Brunetti in Chicago, he teaches at Columbia, he's good. Um, there are a lot of good ones. Picasso, Picasso made a picture of uh, Wernicke. The I, have a, I have a question. Okay. Hi. Uh, what do you think about uh, 
the past season, there was rallies. Do you think it was fair that they gave Israel back to the Jews back in 1949? Was that fair? It's hard that to say. That was fair though, right? I don't know. For uh, what they went through back to war. Well, it was, I mean, they moved out all the Arabs, similar to moving out all the American Indians from there. So that's what happened. I mean, I'm a politician. I just comment on things. So, I mean, I don't think it's right or wrong. I think that's what happened. They moved out the Arabs out of Israel and put them into refugee camps, basically. Something like moving the Indians out of America and putting them onto reservations. And now all they have is reservations in America. So maybe that's what is in store for the Palestinians. They'll have just reservations, little areas where they live together. And, and it'll be like in the US. That's what I think. Okay. Yes? I don't understand why you say you can't make up your mind whether it's right or wrong because there was genocide practiced against the Indians and genocide against African Americans. I think it's wrong. You can't make up your mind. No, I think it's, all right, I think it's wrong, but I'm not going to, I'm not a politician, I'm going to draw about it. I'm not to be a politician. Okay, I think it's wrong. You know what's right and you know what's wrong. Right, I think it's wrong what they're doing, yes, what Israel is doing for what it's worth, as they say. Yeah. Yes, it's wrong. And I can get in a lot of trouble for that. And there's laws on the books of about 20 states against supporters of BDS. People can't, are getting thrown off their job if they don't sign a loyalty thing. It's a fact. And there are lawyers going against that for saying it's free speech, but anyways. But Okay. Uh, that. What do you think of everybody draw Mohammed Day or Mohammed cartoon contest? No opinion. I'm not. I'm not for it. Why didn't you include any of that in your drawing, Mohammed? Yeah, I mean that's that's it's provocative uh, cartoons that are you know. I'm sure it goes up there with all the other ones. Right. I don't think I found any. Okay. I didn't look for it, actually. You should put it in your next presentation. Yeah. Beavis, Pence, and Butthead Bush. What was the theme that was guiding you in assembling this collection? I guess protest, um, socialism, communism, anarchism, criticism, criticism of America, or constructive criticism of trying to make something better, better world. Yes? Is uh, is drawing pictures of Mohammed Islamophobic? I don't know. Uh, no comment. <laughs> <laughs> Cubs or Sox fan? Cubs. Ooh. Why is? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go That's ahead. Charlie. That's yeah, Charlie. Yeah, and you gave us about a dozen. Mediocre things on air in Palestine, and you completely disregarded the social realism of the great helmsman of the, the the victory in 1949 of socialism. Is is there any reason you disregarded what is considered the premier art? You mean China? Of politics? China? Yeah. Are you speaking China? Actually, I had I had that somewhere in one of my presentations. I did have. But it's that you got all this lukewarm stuff in Palestine. But I can figure out why you chose it. Wow. Yeah. But I well, actually, I had okay. I had Mao on a train, on a train, a big train, and it had Mao Zedong on a train, and um, that's all it was. So I don't know. I I had it in one of my presentations, but I just didn't have it here. Next time. Okay. All right. But, uh, well, why did you disregard it? I did disregard it. I just yeah, one wasn't picture. organized well enough. Okay. All right, we got a couple more questions. Um, 
Ellen? I, my sense is that maybe the golden age for, for political art would be, um, I, I used to see things like in Eastern Europe or um, is it Czechoslovakia or I don't know. I mean, are you, do you have any sense of really where the golden age of political art would be? Or? Well, Why I mean, there, there's some now. It's, it, it, it's not like it, it, it ended. It's just not in newspapers. So it's, on, it's online. It's in uh, Intercept. It anywhere. Um, truth Dig, Truth Out, um, mm -hmm. things like that. The Nation has some. In These Times has some. Um, Intercept, like I said. So, I mean, it still goes on today. You just have to look a little harder, it's, and it's, it's not on the daily newspaper. And then Golden Age. What I about, know. and I know the trolls, you know, I, I have this picture of Hillary Clinton looking like, you know, the Wicked Witch of the West. And I guess that's propaganda or fake, right. you know, trolls created art, right? Right. It's, um, vicious, not very thoughtful. Yeah, attack ads, right? Attacking. That seems yeah. attack, um, right. misinformed people. Right. Yeah, yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> you think it should be regulated or um, some way? How? Well, I'm sure some, well, um, in other countries, some journalists are killed. So, I mean, yeah, it's regulated by people like in Charlie Charlie Hebdo you got some terrorist somebody went in and killed some people it was a satire magazine in France in Paris so people got murdered because of what they drew so um, it's a very serious thing that could have been a false flag kind of okay could be anything could be from Mars well, I, I think it's, they killed journalists. I don't know who did it, why they did it, they did it. Well, we should investigate. Next question. Okay, last question. We're going to go to rebuttals right away. Was that a picture of Ronald McDonald on the cross? Yes. Uh, distasteful? Uh, is there a double standard with, like, anti-Christian art and, uh, you know, draw Mohammed sort of art? Well, if you're insulted by Ronald McDonald on the cross, then you know you, you were similar to people who are insulted by depictions of Muhammad in a negative light. So that's the same thing. I mean, you're you're being insulted by your religion. So that's fine. Actually, that that lion then uh, was, a, was a Finnish uh, artist from Finland. And he didn't want. He didn't even want that thing in Israel because he's he's a supporter of BDS. So it's going to get. He didn't want it there, but the gallery took it and put it in the in the gallery. So uh, what's that have to do with BDS? Because he doesn't want to support the economy of Israel. So that's supporting the economy of Israel. That's in his mind. That's what he said. All right. That's what, according to the internet. That's what he said. So. What? what is the artist trying to say with that? I'm not quite sure. Yeah, I don't really know what it is either. It's just some crazy. Yeah. The religion of McDonald's, I guess capitalism or something. Yeah, that's capitalism right. going right. crazy or something. Or, uh, Could it be a false flag? All right. Maybe they're trying to. Make okay. All right. Think that, uh, Do you think anything is not a false flag? I is there such thing as a true a flag? flag? Well, false flags are, are denied as conspiracy theories, and it, if you look at the effect of it in sociology, it probably did make people think that, oh, uh, those liberals are so anti-Christian, you know, um, something like that. But you're dead right. wrong. You know, those artists, crazy artists and liberals. Right. Well, that's mm -hmm. a stereotype, and that, that's basically true, I guess. <laughs> all right. Danny, you, uh, you. All right. Let's go Let's get our rebuttals going. Um, we have had, we've had a special request from one of our rebutters. He's got a brief slideshow to show, so I'm going to get him set up while we uh, take our other. Yeah, I'm get you a drive out of this. We're going to get him set up while we uh, get you guys hooked up with how many other people want to rebut tonight. And the geese going to show our hands. I can start. No. 
now we're going to have uh, our we're having one of our guys start doing. Oh, you you don't you don't want to make a, no 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 talk while he's setting up. No no we're just we're, it's almost oh. done here. Okay. Yeah, we'll we'll go like uh, how many others are rebutting tonight? We'll go about five minutes, okay? And uh, okay, where is she? Which one is she? Which one? Uh, yeah. 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 South Park. South Park. Yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, okay. I'll go ahead. Okay, you're all set. Yeah, you're yeah. Left, 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 left. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, it's not a slide. Can you get that email? No, that's fine. All right. Let's, uh, yeah. Wait a minute, Jimmy, before we start. Yes. Okay. No, this is mine. I got it here. Oh. We're going to go about five minutes apiece. I don't get it. I got to turn it off. All right. Uh, let's get rebuttal started. Five minutes on the clock. Go ahead. And let's get moving. I will. And the show continues. We're going to look at some more political cards. Don't be the mic. All right. I just wanted to sprung it. Let's talk normally. So, uh, let's see. We're going to take a look at... Weinberg, I'm trying to get that email. We're going to take a look at some more. Oh, yeah. This does not work. Because I shut it off. Oh, I'm just going all right, so we're going to look at some uh, International Logic Party uh, political cartoons. Okay. Now, for those of you, a lot of these are South Park themed, so um, if you don't know anything about South Park, there's this, Yeah, can you stop hiking in the back there? There is, thank you. Uh, there was this joke in South Park about the underpants gnomes. They have this plan. There are these boys in South Park. You'll get to meet the boys in a moment. Uh, but there are these underpants gnomes, and they're stealing their underwear. And they have this whole scheme. It's they have phase one. It's to collect underpants. Phase two, and then phase three. It's profit. And they never really explain what phase two is. And I'm like, well, this is really funny. I'm going to make a joke about the International Logic Party about that because it seems that uh, the International Logic Party plan is just as complicated as that of the underpants notes. <laughs> so uh, phase one, collect ideological profiles. <laughs> phase two, International Logic Party is complicated, but it works. Again, I invite you to come to our meetings to actually see how it does work. And then phase three is revolution. Uh, and really, it's evolution, but the R is silent. Um, so uh, instead of profit, it's, uh, it's the democratic evolution. So that, that's this one. Uh, I find this to be hysterical. Um, here's another one. This is one of my favorites because it's simple. Now, Towley is a towel. It's a talking towel in the cartoon. And he's always getting high. <laughs> and he's always coming up to the boys and saying, you want to get high? <laughs> well, well, he's coming up here. <laughs> And he's saying, you want to get high? And some intelligent democracy and the power of the people. And it says International Logic Party right, right on his mouth. It's freaking hilarious. I love it. <laughs> uh, let me know when I got one minute left. Here's, here's another, another really simple one. Uh, there's this planet in South Park. It's called Marklar. And the people from Marklar every noun in their language structure is Marklar. So just, yeah, just in any sentence you imagine, they just say Marklar for it. So um, so here it becomes international Marklar. Marklar, we come in Marklar. Because <laughs> they're from Marklar. You have to watch the right. um, <laughs> I'm a uh, so yeah, International Logic Party. Here's another one, um, Lovebirds. That's a good one, but that's kind of complicated. Whereas, oh, I really like this one. So Cartman is kind of a racist, kind of, he's kind of hateful. Kyle, which is the guy in the green hat, he's a Jew. And 
Cartman always makes fun of Kyle for being a Jew, and then Kyle makes fun of Cartman for being fat and for being a racist. And uh, you can go ahead, I'm not going to read that for you. Um, but it's funny if you actually imagine the boys saying this. It is a very funny show. Read it. Uh, uh, all right, I'm going to try to imitate the voices. So Cartman says, hey, you guys, I just joined the super sweet political party. It's going to be huge. And I'm going to make a million dollars. But you can't join, Kyle. And Kyle says, terrible. Why the hell not, Cartman? And Cartman says, because it's all about transparency. And people are going to find out you're a dirty Jew. And then Kyle says, screw you, fat ass. I don't care if people find out that I'm a Jew but they will find out that you're a racist, fascist, sociopath. And Cartman says, ah, fuck! Because <laughs> the International Logic Party is all about transparency. You don't really move forward in the ILP unless you're actually open about what you stand for. Um, again, you'll understand how that works when you actually come to our meeting, uh, which, again, you're invited to. And one last meme to wrap this up. There's actually one more that I love, but like I said, we're not going to get into that. Here's, and this is really one of my favorites because this again captures another, um, another fact about the International Logic Party. This is what George Washington would say if he were alive today. However political parties may now and then answer popular ends, they're likely in the course of time and things to become potent engines by which cunning, ambitious, and unprincipled men will be enabled to subvert the power of the people and to, how do you say, usurp? Usurp? Usurp for themselves the reins of government. That's the actual uh, George Washington quote, but then the next part is what he would say if he was alive. Except for the International Logic Party, which is the intelligent democracy where the people always have the power. The ILP is exactly how I envision the perfection of American politics. Join us now. Okay. Uh, Thirty seconds left. Well, all right. Well, all right. That was that was my big finish. But hell, I, I really love this other meme. So let's do that. Um, South Park. Birds. Okay, so uh, Saddam Hussein and, and Satan become lovers, and so Saddam gets persuaded to join the International Logic Party, and uh, wait, I said Satan, Satan, and then uh, Saddam is uh, looking at this uh, book for you know gay cruises, cruising for semen. <laughs> you get that, it, and then it says. Satan, he's talking to himself. If Saddam and I join the International Logic Party, I vo our voices will be equal. Finally, Saddam will have to listen to me. Because that's a problem. Saddam is very abusive to Satan, and Satan plays a feminine role. And then Saddam says, yeah, that is interesting. Let's fuck. Because, <laughs> you know, Saddam doesn't really care about uh, Satan. And then Satan says, okay, Saddam. But, but this International Logic Party is starting to sound a whole lot less gay than that cruise, cruise ship party. Thank you. All right. It drives in the back if you want to pull it out. Uh, yeah, how do I? Oh, just, just, just close out. Do just, I? You know, just, just keep it there because what we're going to do is if anybody else wants to use it, just leave it up. Oh, wait, hold on. How do I pull out my drive? Oh, yeah, just, just pull it out of the back. Just pull it out without yeah. disconnecting it? Yeah, that's okay. It's, it's, it's good. It's going to corrupt my files, I'm telling you. There we go. All right. I mean, I haven't had that problem since. Okay, Margaret, when you're ready. Okay, for a change, if I'm not going to do on the topic exactly, but I'm going to do around the topic. Um, I was first introduced to Bill Malden when, um, oh man, 1950s, 1960s. And it was because um, he was actually best known for his cartoons during the Second World War. He came from... Um, if you stop your background conversation, we can hear okay, what is going on from. So he... Um, uh, he basically, and my father liked him a great deal, and one reason is that my father was in the uh, infantry and in the army during the Second World War in the 45th Division, and that was the division that Bill Malden was an was a infantryman in. And he did his um, cartoons, and they became very popular. He published in the Stars and Stripes, which was the newspaper that was published for the military. 
and um, they got their news with that. And it was well read, and, and it, in fact, it probably was the only newspaper that a lot of the people, a lot of military people got to begin with, particularly if they were in the military. It takes a while, Charlie. So he graduated from the uh, Art Institute here, and um, Bill Malden. he. Bill Malden. Um, and um, and he got two Nobel Prizes. One was for his work during the Second World War, oh. and the second one was for a cartoon that he um, did when Boris Pasternak was not allowed to go for the Nobel Prize um, and because he was in prison in Russia, or he wasn't allowed to leave Russia to go to the for the Nobel Prize. So he drew Boris Pasternak in prison, and he sang to um, a fellow inmate. I won the Nobel Prize for Literature. What's your crime? So he got the uh, Nobel Prize. Charlie, for that. don't do that. So his. Use, use the Firefox. You're going to do that. I'm sorry, are you talking to me? He's. I'm sorry about that. He was just going to do something. I got my computer set up for, for Chrome. Well, anyway. Go ahead. So, can you take 30 seconds off of my time? Of course. Uh, <laughs> so at any rate, he uh, during the war he he really did take the the he was considered a, a a person who stood up for the infantrymen and for the grunts and and uh, the people who were at the bottom. And so he was with Patton was one of the people that he was with in the Fifth Army, and he didn't Patton didn't like him because he was, he made fun of the officers. There's a really funny cartoon where he's, there's an old, um, there's a, a young shaved tail lieutenant who's green and has water behind, wet behind the ears and whatever, sitting at his desk and an old grizzled sergeant comes in and the lieutenant looks at him and he said, just think of me as your father, you know. So to and, and that was what they told them that they had to do in, in the military to get the, the trust of the of the, uh, of the soldiers. But this sergeant had seen like four thousand more things than this lieutenant ever did. Really didn't want to do it this there was way, no way he was going to do that. But at any rate, so Patton was going to throw the book at him, and Eisenhower, who was Patton's superior, told him to lay off because he said that it, it was like a vent for people to see their real feelings put in in, in print and um, that they could read them and, and they could really relate to the, to uh, what he was saying about them because he was one of them. Thank you. So after the, he eventually worked for the Sun Times until he died. And so he was in he has a lot of Chicago connections. All right, next, please. Um, about Soviet art, actually I've seen a lot of pictures of Soviet art, and people say well, they, had a, they had a paint like Stalin wanted them to paint. That's not true at all, because what happened, I've seen a lot of art that was of the, of the countryside, of the cities, of plants and stuff like that, and it wasn't all political. But the political part, what the Communist Party wanted, it was a revolutionary situation, and the revolution the situation, you got to reflect the situation at hand and what it's trying to do and trying to accomplish, not only in the short run, but also in the long run. And when we look at art, art has a very strong emotional component. Just like music has a very strong emotional component. And when you have an emotional component, it really installs the feeling like you want to get things done along those lines. And if you look at primitive society, let's say um, in Indian society, the wars between the Americans and the Indians and so forth and so on, or of gathering of the, of the crop during the season. The Indians always danced and made costumes in order to get them emotionally set 
to go ahead and do what has to be done. And in the revolutionary situation where uh, Russia was attacked from about maybe 14, 15 nations, and one of them was the United States, and one of the generals of the United States, General Graves, was the leader, and they, want, and they invaded Russia right after the revolution. So they had a very, very bad situation there, and they wanted art to reflect that. And people have a stake in something, and they had a big stake in, in right after the revolution. The farms were parceled off to the peasants, to the coup, and they were against the kulaks to a certain degree. The kulaks were the middle class farmers who had a few cows and stuff like that, but were against the revolution. But the vast majority of peasants were very much for the revolution, and they also had a lot of art reflecting that, and that would advance the revolution. Because if you have a strong emotional feeling, you want to do something about it, it's not just thinking about something, but it's a way of getting you to act in a certain direction. So art is very important in the, in the revolution or any other time. If you look at American art, let's say we have these marches. When people go to war, they have these marches and they have the music for the marches and that makes them very patriotic and they want to go and defeat the enemy and so forth and so on. So art is very important. But uh, I wanted to make a few remarks. What's happening in Latin America, especially in Venezuela, where the United States is trying to overthrow the government there. And, uh, well, to begin with, Hugo Chavez was put in prison right after the revolution by the reactionaries there. And, and the army supported Hugo Chavez because he was a general there. So the army was very supportive, and he got out eventually. But they, the United States has been trying to overthrow Hugo Chavez or any other revolutionary situation, just like we've been trying to overthrow Cuba since the revolution. Because that means that the corporations that uh, steal and plunder these uh, South American countries and any third world country doesn't want a revolution to succeed. And what they're doing now is trying to get rid of, uh, of the leader there, Maduro. They're trying to get rid of them. And if they get rid of them, they'll bring in fascism like they've all done all along in Latin America. And we have the School of the Americas where we train these officers in Latin America all kinds of, in all kinds of atrocities. And if they ever go back to what they were before, you're going to have fascism there. So it's got to be uh, something that's got to be resisted. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, it's Ellen? Yeah, I'll go up. No, I'm next. Oh, okay, sorry. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, yeah. Okay. Hi, I'm Ellen Corley. Um, always glad to be here at the Free Speech Forum, the College of Complexes. Such an important role to play in society, and we don't really see enough of it. Um, I don't know where else to do it, really, except we used to do it in school, right? Uh, I went to a John Dewey school, so I was lucky in that regard. I think, um, you know, the, the older I get, the more I realize that, um, you know, the, the ideas make more sense, like John Dewey talking about education every life is like a big school and society is what he's talking about the need to freely make meaning together and i think um you know art makes more sense when you look at it within a social context that's why you know i think it's an interesting subject 
but I think we also, we always have to um, kind of construct and deconstruct and understand what it's saying. And, I, you know, um, Dan mentioned that I think everything's a false flag thing, but I, um, I'm i very concerned about false flags. I, ever since I've come to understand what they are, uh, they basically... Um, they're, they're used to get us into war, you know, um, and they're kind of using, being used to divide and conquer us. Uh, this was Hitler's jurist idea, divide and conquer, strategy of tension. That's why he shipped, uh, I was reading today about Hitler, actually the, there's a lot of evidence that shows that Hitler, um, you know, went down to South America along with a lot of other Nazis and came to America. and. Um, you know, they, he wasn't really killed, but there, we really have what is essentially fascism developing, but because it's covert, um, you know, you don't, and there's also, it's been done through the CIA, and people say, oh, that's a conspiracy theory. Well, the CIA came up with that idea that if you say there, this is a false flag, they'll say that's a conspiracy theory. So you have to wonder if there's ever gonna be able to find truth. That's why my art is, uh, I was going to give an example of just last night, the last few nights, I read and I write something, but yet it's about, it's almost like whistleblowing. There's a lot of pressure, and I feel it, you know, that I'm doing what Orwell said, which is say what they don't want you to say. Everything else is PR, right? And that is so true that... When I worked in a corporation, I worked in advertising, I was a strategic planner, and coming up here with DDB Needham, second largest one. But I, I was always just trying to say what they wanted me to say, make the client look good, you know? And um, if you say something that makes the client look bad, it's, you know, Daniel Ellsberg wrote about that in the, most, in the recent Project Censored uh, book saying, you know, how difficult it really is to be a whistleblower. I know Michael Moore, I thought was interesting, uh, his documentary is very effective at showing what, you know, their art, right, showing uh, what the war is really like, um, you know, uh, like inside job, a lot of documentaries, which are journalism, but they, they wake you up as, you mean, really? We just... We're, we just made this war up by, you know, orchestrating 9-11. That, those have been other documentaries that are widely suppressed. Um, but they're excellent, this Adam uh, 9-11 trillions and all these ones. That, you know, over years, thank goodness for these young... Actually, it was produced by Alex Jones. Half of what he says is probably some... Uh, right-wing propaganda, but it, the question is what what half, you know? Um, but recently, what gets me is Peter Phillips, who was the editor of Project Phillip, um, Project Censor, wrote me, you know, Ellen, I, most of what you say is valid, but, uh, you know, I recently, one, you posted this Adam Green um, talking about, uh, he talks with Christopher Bolin about 9-11, and he's exposing some interesting false flag propaganda techniques of that the um, these two guys in Georgia, these two PR guys orchestrate these like, like you know, oh look, they're warring on, I forget, Trump, you know, it's a conspiracy to pull a coup on Trump, that's what the deep state is, and you know, they, they this is their PR strategy of tension, you know, it's like make it look like, uh, you know, we're going to pull a coup on Trump. That's not what the deep state is more, where, you know, it's a fake one, a false flag one. Um, but anyhow, but it hurts me to hear that when I, it's people that I want their respect. If a liberal comes and says, you know, you're wrong, Ellen, you know, I get this little shameful feeling that I used to get from my stepfather, and I and Rand, Milton Friedman, uh, you know, like Manchurian candidate, you know, and, but I was buying into it, you know, I'll program it, I'm, I'm not radical, I'm not liberal, I'm not, 
You know, I'm not for peace. So you're a hippie and you know it. I'm like, I don't know it. Maybe I am, but uh, you know, is that okay? You're going to disinherit me? You know, and that's the kind of pressure we get. You know, we've got to say what they don't want us to say. We, you know, that's what the role of art is. And uh, it's, you know, speak up, stick your neck out. It's easier if you've already, you know, uh, you don't need the job. But um, I, so anyhow, I wrote back last night and I, I, this to me is the dialectic, you know. They're gonna pressure you for being, saying something radical. Um, you know, did I, was I wrong with that? I go back, look at the facts and the truth is, I posted something again, even more radical. I wake up, oh boy, what do these people think? But then they like them, you know? Um, and I've uh, been reading Michael Parenti, brilliant socialist, uh, and I'm developing a Marxist mindset, and it's okay, even though the greatest PR scam in the whole world was in the early 1900s against anarchists, socialists, and uh, communists. We've got to stop the war on communism. Thank you. Okay. All right. I'm going next. No, no, I am. Oh, go ahead, Joe. My apologies, please. Thank you. Sorry about that. Okay. I was drafted out of grad school by the U.S. Army in the 1950s. Uh, but the Army had a program at that time called S&P, Scientific and Professional. If you had a degree in one of those uh, areas, the uh, Army would give you basic training and then put you in a national laboratory to work as a scientist or engineer. But the professional aspect was also uh, uh, working for artists because they drafted artists out of school. And um, I, I worked in Huntsville, Alabama for Werner von Brown and uh, everyone's favorite Nazi. But in our group, we had uh, two artists. One was from England, and, and the other was from uh, Los Angeles. And it was interesting because those of us who were drafted out of uh, graduate school were, were pissed. And uh, we, we, we coined the phrase FTA, fuck the army. And uh, the artists in our group uh, picked that up and they would, uh, their job was to draw posters, to make posters to spread around uh, Redstone Arsenal. And they did. And uh, especially at, uh, in October during National Fire Week, they would create uh, horrible scenes of homes or buildings that had burnt. And they always managed to get the timbers in the uh, in the picture to spelled out F T A. And uh, the the officer corps didn't catch on. So it was, it was a lot of fun to pass by these posters, which were everywhere, and uh, realize what it meant. I'm going to go next. All right. Here we, here we go again. Everybody's saying the glories of socialism and how it's going to improve lives. We all know that experiment failed because developing countries didn't really get started developing until they adopted capitalist and free trade principles. And the numbers bear it out. So to all you socialists out there, to quote an economist by the name of uh, Johan Norberg, you're just dead wrong. The truth of the matter is the worldwide spread of free trade and capitalism has been one of the biggest economic booms to the world. Has helped people develop, has helped countries get out of poverty. We're seeing today the widespread elimination of dire poverty, the expansion of people doing well around the rest of the world. And even though you think that things are a little bit crazy now, 
The truth of the matter is human life is getting much better. We're seeing an extension of life. We're seeing the elimination of illiteracy. We're starting to see the elimination of di abject poverty. We're starting to see life, life around the world being extended a little bit longer. And finally, we're starting to see, even with the help of renewables and things, the widespread adoption and availability of electric power for, the, for power for the people. And to be honest with you, I think we're seeing the greatest flowering in human history for it. Capitalism works. Communism and socialism doesn't. I know it's really appealing to go into class conflict and all this stuff, but we've all heard that before. In any country that develops a widespread Marxist or socialist theory, usually within a few years, is down the tubes. And I'll give you our most current example of Venezuela with Chavez and everything else. Now they're experiencing a hyperinflation. If you can just get over the fact that the rich do get rich under capitalism because they work and they have incentives, generally the poor and the middle class do much better under a capitalist system than they would under a communist or uh, somewhat of another type of system. It's not that capitalism's not without its problems, it does have them, especially when, it, when you give special favors to business like the corporations to protect their monopoly in markets. What we really need around the rest of the world is free markets, open trade, and fair-minded capitalism. The role of the government is to simply moderate those forces and enforce contracts and property laws. And I think if we did that on more of a widespread basis, we would see a much more prosperous world. Thank you. Next. <laughs> all right, Charlie, all right. One of my all-time favorite works of political art is this uh, portrait of Milton Friedman, uh, where he's kind of, if you can't see it, he's kind of doing this dignified sort of, you know, deal. Uh, it was taken around the time of 2006, so this is right before he died. Um, so, I mean, if you're going to, I mean, I think that... This is better than the Obama Hope portrait. This is much more better. But Re Friedman's words are are uh, Your artistry. are are the closest thing I think there are to scripture. Uh, <laughs> so let me let me let me read a couple things. Uh, by the way, Friedman considered himself a liberal. He didn't consider himself a conservative. Uh, as liberals, we take <laughs> freedom of the individual, or perhaps the family is our ultimate goal in judging social arrangements. Freedom as a value in the sense has to do with interrelations among people. It has nothing to do whatsoever with to a Robinson Crusoe on an isolated island. The, uh, the liberal conceives of men as imperfect beings. He regards the problem of social organization to be as much a negative problem of preventing bad people from doing harm as enabling good people to do good. And of course, bad and good people may be the same people, depending on who's judging them. The basic problem of social organization is how to coordinate the economic activities of large numbers of people. Even in relatively backward societies, extensive division of labor and specialization of function is required to make effective use of available resources. In advanced societies, the scale on which coordination is needed to take full advantage of the, the opportunities offered by modern science and technology is enormously greater. Literally millions of people are involved in providing one another with their daily bread, let alone with their yearly automobiles. The challenge to the believer in liberty is to reconcile the widespread interdependence with international freedom, or excuse me, indiv the individual freedom. <laughs> Fundamentally, there is two ways of coordinating economic activities of millions. One is central direction involving the use of coercion, the technique of the army and of the modern totalitarian state, or like a Bernie Sanders or uh, you know Hugo Chavez sort of thing. If we're you know using today's examples, uh, the other is a voluntary cooperation of individuals, the technique of the marketplace. The possibility of coordination through voluntary cooperation rests on the, end of, on the elementary, yet frequently denied, proposition that both parties to an economic tr 
transaction benefit from it, provided the transaction is bilateral, voluntarily, and informed. Exchange can therefore bring about coordination without coercion. A working model of society organized through voluntary exchange is a free, private enterprise exchange economy, what has been called competitive capitalism. This is uh, scripture, and it's uh, probably holy words. You're forgetting about study. his uh, documentary, Free to Choose, made in 1980, and then the revision in 1990. <coughs> yeah, <coughs> there's uh, Friedman produced a series of documentaries uh, called Free to Choose. They're on YouTube. There's like 10 parts. Check them out. Thank you. A purely good artistic endeavor. All right, next, please. Please, you're up. Good evening, everybody. Closer to the mic. Okay. What do the front say? Pardon my English. That's fine. Tony Perwinkle on climate change. Tuesday, January 22nd, Tony Perkwinkle, Cook County Board President, announced that Cook County and the Forest Preserves of Cook County are stepping up the fight against climate change. Next topic. I was employed in a factory office in the 60s and 70s. Um, the union forced us to go on strike, then laid off, layoffs began. There were 24,000 people working there, and then it dropped to 7,000, and now it's all gone. The buildings are all gone. I am addicted to ice mountain water. Four cases lasted only two weeks. The, temp the company it tells me um, chemicals and e excess plastic have been removed. Not sure, but it sure tastes good to me. Near beer may be an option. <laughs> Query. Is cannabis oil good option for advanced neuropathy, which I suffer yes. from? Audience? Is it a good option? Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. You don't need to smoke it anymore. Mm -hmm. Audience? Did you know that? Yeah. Uh-huh. Can be in uh -huh. yeah. California. Okay. How much time do we have? I don't have too much more. About two minutes left. Okay. I don't have much to say. About nursing homes. I was in a nursing home for three years, so I got all the information here. 30% yeah. below average rating. 37% are below average rating. 2.3 million people will become victims of nursing home abuse. I saw it there. They were horrific stories. 90% understand. Only one of 14 cases of abuse are reported. Home health care is where, wherever patient calls home. Mm -hmm. That's all. All right. All right. Next. Okay. Um, I'm a big fan of Bill Baldwin. Uh, my favorite cartoon is um, uh, where. Uh, uh, Joe is standing there and his uh, heart is broken because his steed has, is mortally injured and he wants to put him out of his misery. And he has his hands over his face like this with the pistol out, but it's pointed at the hood of a Jeep that has a broken axle. <laughs> That's my favorite cartoon by him. Um, I wanted to come up here and kind of point out something. I really did like the presentation. It's a really interesting topic. Uh, but I was surprised that uh, what I consider the uh, most controversial political cartoon of the century wasn't listed up there. Can anybody guess what I'm talking about? No. The Muhammad cartoon from Sweden or whatever. Yeah. So, so it's a it's a it's a photo of Muhammad. Okay. And uh, but in his uh, turban, there's a bomb. What? In the the turbans, turbans, there's bombs. In his turban, his hat, his Muslim hat, there's a bomb. There's a bomb in it. And, uh, and this, 
caused a huge uproar in the Islamic community, and uh, and people were killed because of it. People were assassinated by terrorists because of it, and um, and uh, there were other a lot of news outlets in the Western world that were basically wanted to play it safe. So they it was news, but they refused to print an image of the uh, uh, of the cartoon. And I, I think it uh, speaks to uh, some very important issues that are um, some critical issues that um, that the world is dealing with right now. Um, they uh, uh, by not printing the, the image, they were basically kind of a lot of people argue they were chickening out. Uh, here is a um, the Western world practices all these uh, individual rights, including a freedom of speech and freedom of the press, and yet the uh, press is too scared to exercise that right. A lot of people were really upset about it. There, uh, the, the Muslims were very upset because they felt that their re religion had been slandered, uh, unfairly slandered, and uh, they reacted. some reacted in a violent way, but a lot were incredibly upset. Um, others argued that uh, you have a right to be upset, but you, the reaction was not what the Western world thinks is appropriate. You can do your own cartoons. You can use your own cartoons to criticize the Western world, to criticize uh, capitalism, to criticize imperialism, to criticize uh, forcing um, uh, Western values on, uh, on Islamic cultures, uh, they, they. I think that they failed to do that. Uh, so there's this whole, in, and it's still going on today. There is this culture clash that's creating problems all around the world, where the West is, uh, um, the the values and uh, the culture of the West is competing with the the, East, the Middle East and um, Islam, and um, and uh, I think it's an important topic and an important uh, cartoon. Thanks. All right. Next one. Uh, my favorite political cartoon I saw back around 1967, shortly after the uh, Six Day War between Israel and the uh, Arab countries. <clears throat> and uh, it showed a foxhole with Arabs in it, and their gun was busted in half, and they looked very dismal, and there was a salesman on his way to that foxhole, and it, it said, it was captioned, it said, uh, Soviet Arms Salesman. And in another foxhole was the, uh, the Israelis, and they're sitting there all polished up looking real good and victorious with smiles on their faces. And it he had a salesman on his way to the Israeli foxhole where these guys were, and he says, well, boys, I suppose you'll want to reorder. I, that was my favorite political cartoon. I don't want I don't want Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Do you want to go up there? Go ahead. Anybody else? Andy's going. Hey, hi. My name is Ellen. I'm going to uh, speak quickly. Um, just thinking about media. Um, I was reading, um, I don't know if you're familiar with Glenn Greenwald, and he writes on The Intercept. Now, his latest piece, his latest blog, um, is... I believe it's about the, the 10, what he views as the 10 worst media mistakes, <laughs> or maybe they're not mistakes, um, um, regarding, I think, like the Trump gate and um, Trump and Russia. And, um, and then he has, after, after the 10 worst, he has a dishonorable mention um, section, and I mean, I, I was really stunned um, by this latest post. Damn it! It's, it's just stunning. It, it, you know, it's CNN, it's even the Guardian, and you know, I, I suppose I was raised um, to re 
much. Somewhat raised to respect authority, uh, certainly to respect newspapers and think that they're accurate. And um, I mean, I, I know that's not the case, but you know, I still have that tendency to think that way. And um, we really have to question our media. And it's not just, you know, the crazy fake news out there on the web. I mean, we have to question mainstream newspaper articles. And it's, and that's, that's the world we live in. And, 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 and I think it makes it really confusing to know where to go to get your news and who you can trust. Um, because what we think of as trustworthy isn't necessarily so trustworthy. And one of the things that um, Glenn Greenwald points out is that you would, if it was just errors, if it was just kind of random errors, you would think it would be like 50% in Trump's favor and 50% against Trump. Just random errors, right? No, it's like he's arguing it's, they're all anti-Trump. They're all anti-Trump. All these major errors in the, in the mainstream media are, are anti-Trump that he's pointing out. Um, so while Trump, I think very poorly of Trump, I, I extremely dislike him, um, it, it's not like the people who are against Trump are necessarily good guys. It doesn't mean they're behaving in an ethical way. Um, it, it, does, it doesn't mean that their behavior, and I'm not just talking about the media, but just in general, it doesn't mean that their behavior should, should be I got it. I got it. thought of well, um, should be trusted or, or thought of well. Um, you know, one time I was at a, um, a secular meeting, and um, somebody in the room said, oh, you know, us seculars, we're, we're just better than these religious people you know, kind of, that kind of talk. And you know, I happen to know that um, at least one person in that room was a very despicable human being, okay? So, it, it, this, this way we, we think about groups and inclusion in groups, and then we think our group is all correct and, and doing the right thing, and, and we just discard the people, we. Did, we, we think less of, you know, who are different, who have opposing views, and, and not realize that, that they they may have another perspective that ha has worked. Let me see if I can. I did not really not follow the story of the kid, um, the kid in opposition to the Native American man, Philip, I believe his name was. But, you know, originally there was one video displayed that gave people, I suppose, Charlie one particular impression what? of the incident. But then, over, eventually, there was another video that showed things from a different perspective, maybe a longer video. So what, what I'm trying to say is, you know, we have to kind of try to look at, that's another thing, look at, look at the bigger picture. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. I wish someone would make a cartoon of my favorite submission to a novel in 12 words or less contest. And it goes, there are no atheists in foxholes, said the chaplain, so get out. <laughs> atheists in foxholes tends to be mentioned a lot at the Ethical Humanist Society, and I'd like <coughs> you to invite you to come tomorrow at 10.30 a.m. Um, the topic is Why We Need Religion. It's given by an atheist author. I'd also like to follow up on what Caesar said and invite you to the International Logic Party meetings. There's at least four per week, so join me and Caesar and Rachel and hammer out your own, very own ideological profile. Last Monday, we hammered out our position on prison reform that we could all support. 
Um, I'm trying to pin down my own thoughts on the need for a national, one or more national languages in this country, and also to kind of <coughs> narrow my thinking on assisted suicide. So it's a lively exchange of ideas and it's very interesting. Flyers in the back. Woo! All right. He can't connect, so. Okay. Let me do it. I can make a speak round back there. Tim, I'll do it. Uh, three weeks from now, for those of you that are interested in discerning the difference between fake news and real news, or illusion versus reality, I'm going to be giving a talk on that general subject. Uh, I'm going to give a brief update on the top most radioactive blacked out stories in America that I've been uh, researching since I talked about them in 2007 here when I first started giving speeches 12 years ago and since then a, a mountain of forensic evidence has been uh, published and developed on all of those subjects. Many of them are still being blacked out. Probably today uh, you can search the newspapers in vain for any mention of a young Swedish girl named Greta Thunberg. Does that name ring a bell yes, to anybody she's here? A you know her, right? Yeah. Have you seen her in the mainstream I, media I've being covered on our television, yeah, CNN? Seen, there was the, well, I don't own a television. Um, I just read, I get my news from the internet. <laughs> right, that's what I'm talking about. There's a blackout on mainstream news for all the Fox News watchers and the cows potatoes are getting their mainstream uh, impressions of living in a bubble of mythology what's happening around the world once you get outside the American bubble. This young woman has uh, done something that is probably akin to what Martin Luther King did, uh, stick, you know, protesting and risking your life to get a message out of universal justice. She's talking about climate change and it's uh, she went on strike from school. She said, what am I doing in school if I have no future? Well, that has spread to other countries. Uh, the numbers are up over 100,000 now in just a few weeks. And it's growing uh, in probably 20, 25 countries. Well, it's not ridiculous. It is. Okay. To get bad grades? I'll take a time out here. Uh, we have a problem with people heckling the speaker when you're trying to say something that is based in reality. And I'm going to be talking reality? about that. Uh, reality is one thing, fake news is something else. And when, when you report fake news as real, it slows down the spread of actual solution-based knowledge that could actually help a problem rather than let it get worse. So I will, uh, for probably five or ten minutes in that upcoming talk, I'll give a summary of what thousands of scientists have published on the reality of what's known about uh, global warming and climate change. There are still some people in the country that think that global warming is not happening, is not real, where thousands of scientists and researchers all over the world are publishing pictures, satellite photos and everything else on the ground trips of the ice melting at both poles in Greenland. At the rate the ice is melting, we're going to pass a tipping point in 2030. That, that, the window kind of closes in about 2030. Uh, we have 11 to 12 years to get a massive program going to stop the increase in global warming. But past 2030, the climate is just going to be, continue to warm up bit by bit until the methane thaws and the temperature of the planet goes up 8 or 10 degrees by 2015, 2016. That's the solid science right now, and that's probably a conservative estimate. So this is why this young girl is risking her life, ruffling the feathers of fossil fuel billionaires, telling them to their face that you've been making billions, whoops, it says my time, you've been making billions by burning our future, and it's got to stop. So there's uh, 
Extinction Rebellion, Sunrise, Rise for Climate. There's youth-led groups all over the world fighting for the future now, and the American press isn't covering any of them. So uh, come three weeks if you're interested in seeing something that's reality-based. Thank you. All right, let's thank our speaker again uh, for a nice uh, presentation there. I'll be eclectic as usual. I don't know how much time we got, but I'll, I'll bounce on. First of all here, uh, I didn't miss a day of school from the third grade until the end of high school because my parents placed a value on maturity and dependability and the value of education. Now you're advocating that all the children, students, should stay home for one day a week in support of some issue. Now I can imagine this if I went home and I got poor grades in all my subjects and my parents inquired why this was, Charles, I would say it's because of climate change. <laughs> well, do you know what would have happened to me? <laughs> That's because nobody talked about it. <laughs> now, this is the only thing that these young, there's a sunrise movement. I've already put the thing up about the meeting coming up on February 13th in Chicago, in which they're attempting to influence the decision-making people Affecting, inflicting the, affecting the climate policy of the United States, and he'll be the next president of the United States. And I think I'll give a little more credit to those young people. And they got a plan they developed. They talked about it here, and I, they like to have fun too. But there's an extent to hooliganism, and there's something about it encouraging. You know, that that's matter of fact. That'll get you thrown out of school. I was thinking about it, I was computing about it. If you took, that's how we, we used to get rid, we never flunked students in CPL. You got them out of attendance. And just like that, I was trying to compute, I go, that's a guaranteed failure. And of course, you have to, you have to have at least that minimum attendance. Getting back to other things, the topic that tonight, uh, Timmy was talking here about capitalism. I don't think it qualifies. Uh, artwork and politics, I gave a program here on photographs of child labor. Uh, where you know, he just he stepped out. Uh, I'll have to give him a copy of that, you know, so if he wants some artwork. Uh, they did 5,000 photographs uh, of, of uh, child labor in the United States, and that was one of the methods they got public sentiment about getting out of it, using politics and art. One of the things, that if you're ever in Washington, I cannot highly regard this advice, recommend this more than any other thing, is right downtown by the sports stadium. There are two, there's the National Portrait Gallery and the National Gallery of American Art is the Smithsonian Institution, which has 13 museums, but those are the two that I would highly recommend that you go to. It may sound boring to some, but no, if you're looking for political arts, that's basically the place to go. Also, if you're in Washington, you could go all over town, walk about 100 feet, and you're going to come into some form of sculpture. I was involved in the art and architecture movement, and no longer do they have, for the federal government, they put up new buildings, but they've gotten away from having a, a, a guy on a horse, the general on the horse, as they always used to do, and now they have general artworks. Uh, in, in uh, things. The, um, I, saved, I saved the hero, actually I had a collection here, and one of the things that distinguished the last presidential election was not the fact that we, we elected a Bethune as President of the United States, was the fact that all of the political campaigns competed on creating a logo. Uh, each, each campaign competed on coming up with a nifty work of art as symbolic of their campaign. And that's it. The, uh, another thing is, one art of piece of art, political art, that I think everyone has seen is this woman with her arm up like this, Rosie the Riveter. And you may, historians like to discredit or just tell the truth about what happened, 
But that picture actually was not used during World War II. It appeared briefly in one Westinghouse factory for about two slip? weeks. Oh. It actually was discovered in a collection in 1980 uh, and resurrected by the, uh, the archives. And that's, it actually became popular only quite recently. And it really, there was a Rosie the Riveter, there was a song, but certainly that picture was that, and that portrait was not easy. You missed it, Timmy. I was going to get you a copy of my, my photo collection of, chil of childs at labor. You know, you might want to take my, some artwork, you know, of capitalism. Send, send you it know. to my, uh, you know. All what right, we'll do, you know. So oh, you can like see, uh, you know, what, uh, the other thing is, possibly, and, and I already indicated that, is the social realism. I draw inspiration from that, uh, like that. And what the hell, what happened to Norman Rockwell? You know, is that political art? I don't know, how can you give that thing and leave out a good right. friend Norman Rockwell? Dan, yeah, thank you very much. Dan, you get the last word. Yeah. Wrap it up real quick. We got about two minutes. Andy, what are you doing? Hey, 10 seconds. Uh, Charlie was absolutely correct when he said uh, he didn't walk out of school to protest because there was nothing to protest when he was in school. But he missed the time a whole bunch of people walked out of school and put their school on hold in 1941 to enter the four-year war effort to solve a big problem. So, uh, okay, please, like Danny, putting your Andy. education on hold is not new. Okay, Dan's got to get the last word. Yeah. All right, uh, thank you everybody. So one, one or two things. Uh, Democracy Incorporated by Sheldon Coleman. He says there's a coup d'etat by the corporation. Number two, our, the Art Institute of Chicago. There's a lot of peer pressure in our, all art schools. I guess this isn't the forum for talking about art. I guess this, this place you like to talk about politics and economics, okay. not art. One more thing, the lifespan in the United States is going down for the first time. People are living shorter. Thank you very much. Okay, give us out, Andy. Okay, that's it for the College of Complexes tonight. We'll see you all next week. We're adjourned. Thank you.